Okay, go ahead. All right. Well, welcome everyone to my dissertation defense. Uh, my dissertation was the impact of leader psychological capital on team performance and behaviors. And it was a multi-level analysis, which I will explain a little bit more of that as we go through. Um, the agenda for today, we're going to go through a brief introduction, um, talk about the nature of the study, the literature review, my research design and methodology, findings, the discussion and conclusion, and then I will open it up. Um, we'll look at some feedback from the committee so that everyone, I wanted to share um, all of the great insights that they gave, and then we'll open it up for questions. So um, first and foremost, I would like to thank my dissertation committee, which includes my chair, Dr. Malater, um, and then Dr. Thompson and Dr. Parker Williams. Without these three individuals, this would not have come together the way that it did. So thank you very much. And just a little bit about me, I believe everyone on the call knows me, but just a brief summary. Um, I am in my 24th year of my management career. Um, I have worked with leading, planning, staffing, budgeting for organizations from startup level to thriving companies with thousands of staff on a global scale. I'm currently the uh, Senior Director of Global HR Advisory for a company called Vistra. And in my role there, I help companies and advise um, on organizations that are expanding internationally, either going overseas or outbound from the U.S. or coming inbound to the U.S. Um, I have also held roles um, as Director of Studio Operations for a video game developer, Iron Galaxy. I've been Global Director of Human Resources and also Founding Principal of Boone Management Group, which was a company that I started in 2010. Additionally, I've held adjunct faculty positions at Kendall College, Insec University, and Lake Forest Graduate School of Management. In addition to pursuing this PhD in organizational leadership, I also hold a Master of Jurisprudence in Business Law and Corporate Governance from Loyola University Law School. I have an MBA from Florida Metropolitan University and a Bachelor's of Business Administration and Human Resource Management from Loyola University um, of Chicago School of Business. So to go through the nature of the study and give you a little bit of background on what prompted me to do this, um, throughout my career, even very early in my career when I had no experience, I always felt that a lot of um, things with leadership were either done wrong or weren't done right or weren't focused on people, um, was usually highly negative, authoritarian. Um, types of personalities that I worked with, and I felt that leadership and business can be good done a different way. In today's business climate, we know that organizations are operating in volatile and uncertain times. What's really funny is I wrote this sentence three years ago when I first started working on um, just the topic in general, and it is more relevant today than I think it was back then. Additionally, um, Luthens, who is one of the pioneers of psychological capital, also shared some of the same thoughts back in 2003. So as we can see, the um, challenges for business aren't really changing over time, but now we're adding a dynamic where businesses are more diverse, they're employing global workforces, and leaders are not only managing demands of their jobs, but they're also trying to lead teams with cultural differences. And in most cases, they really don't have um, the background or understanding on how to navigate that. So the problem that I was looking at here is being a leader is very complex. Um, leaders are typically ill-equipped to meet the demands of the business and they find themselves in no-win scenarios. Um, what I wanted to do with this study is to advance the leadership methodology to bridge the growing gap between organizational, lead, organizational needs excuse me, and leadership capabilities. So research has found that positive human traits and behaviors may have a significant impact on desired outcomes. And then organizations we know must be a lot more agile now. Even if we look at what's happened over the past three months, my organization went to 98% work from home like many of the other companies did. Um, they had to purchase laptops for 1,300 people in an India call center, and that transition was really monumental. And to be able to do that almost seamlessly with little client impact is a testament to um, their agility. So the purpose of this study is to contribute to the body of knowledge and address this problem by showing how leader psychological capital influences team outcomes and desired organizational behaviors. 
So there's an author named Chen who I will refer to quite a lot because he is one of the only other uh, multi-level studies that have been done around psychological capital. But he found that leaders who have higher levels of psychological capital can transfer those higher levels to their direct reports. And I want to help further that. So in my literature review, um, I took a look at, it started out with hundreds of keywords. You know, I looked at over 300 articles and really kind of narrowed it down to the authors who you see in the middle and focusing on organizational citizenship behaviors, psychological capital, technical and social performance, positive organizational citizen, I'm sorry, positive organizational behaviors, leader member exchange, and then positive leadership. And before I get into this, like my focus was on positive leadership because I've been told throughout my career that I smile too much to be in HR and I can't be that happy going to work every day. And the reality is that I am um, and I believe that other people can be as well. And positive leadership has much more of an impact than negative leadership. However, historically, the research has really taken a negative approach towards workplace orientation and constructs. And so I wanted to kind of break away from that and just look at a different way or defining a different way to lead. So positive organizational behaviors is the genesis of psychological capital. So it's important to know um, that PLB is the study and application of positively oriented human resource strengths and psychological capacities that can be measured, developed, and effectively managed for performance improvement in the workplace. Another really important thing about my research was not only conducting research, but as a previous HR practitioner, I want to be able to create tools that HR our practitioners can implement within their organizations to help make these positive organizational behaviors more prevalent. Um, psychological capital, which is the primary focus of my study, is a higher order core construct that in, integrates the various PLB criteria. I actually skipped that. There are several criteria that must be met um, for PLB. I'm very happy to discuss it with anyone who wants to learn a little bit more about it. Um, but you have to make sure in psychological capital that it integrates those um, various criteria. And then psychological capital, also called PSYCAP, is a second order factor that measures a person's motivational ability developed through psychological resources like hope, efficacy, resilience, and optimism. We also um, looked at job performance. Uh, there are, are way too many job performance measurement tools uh, to try to identify. And so I went through, I think I looked at about six of them and came to technical performance and social performance um, as they were more aligned with what I was hoping to accomplish with my research. So technical performance measures an individual's ability to make decisions, perform tasks without mistakes, and also handle the demands of the job. And then social performance measures the individual's ability to work with others, avoiding fighting, and being able to compromise. Finally, organizational citizenship behaviors um, was another construct that you'll learn a little bit more about. Um, it was originally defined as discretionary behaviors not recognized by a formal workplace reward system and promotes organizational effectiveness. And so really with organizational citizenship behaviors, those are the things like the interactions and the things that we do on a daily basis at work that aren't rewarded. So it's when a coworker gets a call and they have to run out to pick up their child from school early and you step in and complete a project for them and help them meet their um, guide, um, sorry, deadline. So there are over 30 organizational citizenship behaviors which represent individual behaviors. And again, they are discretionary and they're not really recognized in a formal reward system. It was also very important for me to look at leadership. Um, leader member exchange looks at how a leader develops relationships with each of their subordinates. Um, and I wanted to take this a little bit further and look at how that leader's um, exchange with the team is affected and what does that look like once you put all of the individuals together in an aggregate. 
Um, leadership has also been found um, that leader SciCap is associated with follower SciCap and may enhance task and conceptual performance. Um, I sought out to do my research with task and conceptual performance, and unfortunately, the original researcher um, did get back to me, but he didn't have any of his research anymore because he had retired and he was living in Paris very happily. And so that's when I switched to social and task. Um, psychological capital also has been linked to authentic leadership. Um, similar to SciCap, authentic leadership is based on positive leadership um, and is considered another positive resource that can result in positive change across multiple levels. And then leaders can positively facilitate followers' abilities to perform in certain areas when their capabilities complement their followers. There was a really great meta-analysis, and a meta-analysis basically looks at all of the um, quantitative reports and studies on psychological capital, and it broke it down, um, which helped to show that psychological capital has a positive relationship with desired attitudes, desired behaviors, and employee performance, and this is at the individual level. And then it has a negative relationship with undesirable attitudes like cynicism or anxiety or stress and also undesirable behaviors. So there was one study that I found um, which was done by Chen uh, and this was somewhat similar to the study um, that I conducted and what Chen did was he looked at leader psychological capital to understand follower psychological capital, job engagement, and then job performance. And what he found is that um, SciCap was positive related to in desired employee attitudes. Um, SciCap was also found to be positively related to job engagement, as well as um, a leader SciCap did actually influence a follower SciCap. And this was another quantitative study um, that was done. Chen's study was done in a Taiwanese um, company, and he only looked at one company and the leader and employee dynamic within that organization. So my research design and methodology, um, I went back and forth on this a few times, but I came up with the research question, does a leader's level of psychological capital influence team organizational citizenship behaviors and job performance? To do that, I looked at three variables, psychological capital, which was an independent variable for the leader and a dependent variable for the follower. I also looked at organizational citizenship behaviors as a dependent variable and then job performance as a dependent variable. So my hypotheses were, um, one, a leader's level of psychological capital has a positive relationship with their team's level of psychological capital. The second one, a leader's level, I'm sorry, leaders with low levels of psychological capital will have teams who demonstrate undesirable organizational citizenship behaviors. And then my third and final was a leader with high psychological capital will have teams with better job performance. So similar to Chen, I did um, just a theoretical framework visual. And so basically I'm trying to connect the positive and negative relationships between a leader's SciCap and their team performance and behaviors. So the significance of this study, um, this study will expand the body of knowledge about how SciCap can influence team outcomes and behaviors, which has important implications across organizations' performance. Um, all of the literature calls for additional quantitative research to be done. However, uh, due to the complexity of a multi-level analysis, very few have been done. Um, and so when I talk about level two, what we're looking at is taking a team of individuals who report to one manager, aggregating the results of the individuals to form a team score, and then measuring that team score, which is the level two score, against the leader who is at the individual level. 
I chose to do, as you can see, a quantitative research study. Um, throughout this, I bounced back and forth with not doing a quantitative study, with not doing multi-level analysis because it was a little bit tricky. Um, but I kept coming back to the fact that I really wanted to be able to contribute to the body of knowledge, and I didn't want to do the same studies that have been done over and over again. So my multi-level analysis looks at three dimensions within the workplace. Level one represents the individual employee or leader. Level two is the group or team level. And then level three is the organizational level. From a um, POB perspective, level one is the leader or the follower. Level two is the shared level, which would be that team. And then level three is the cultural level where you begin to look at the organization. So my recruitment was really fun. I originally went out um, and tried to be very academic about my research and no one understood what I was talking about. And so I had a conversation with my current manager and tried to explain it to him. And he just said, Melanie, you got to make it simple. Like people don't have time. This is very complex. And so what I did was I created a recruitment campaign. And within this campaign, I sent out targeted emails to organizations on LinkedIn. And in those emails, I had created a recruitment video. I created, you know, the handouts and there's some pictures that you can see right there, just to help people understand what I was trying to accomplish and um, make it simple. I reached out to over 100 companies. I had phone calls with maybe 15 or 20, and I ended up with three organizations that said yes, and that was pre-pandemic. Um, after the pandemic, I actually ended up losing two of my participating organizations and only had one left and did not have enough data. And so my dissertation committee, I led by my chair, helped me to go back out and recruit again um, to get more participants so that I could try to have a really sound study. So the recruitment portion was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. And it create, caused me to be a little more creative in how I explain this to get people to want to participate. My survey was administered through Question Pro, which is a web-based survey tool. Um, I used email as the primary form of contact for each participant. A uh, really interesting thing is I actually couldn't contact the participants directly, um, so I worked through whether it was the HR department or the individual connections um, in the beginning to try to solicit and get uh, approval from the individuals before they participated in the study. Uh, the participants were uh, very confidential. Confidentiality was really important. Each person was given a code ID number so that their results couldn't be traced back to them, which was very important, especially with the companies, um, whether you're working through the HR department or the manager, we want employees to feel comfortable in providing the results. Um, and then the survey was categorized into three levels. There was the leader manager, the follower report, and then the team or the work group. The survey consisted of 10 demographic questions, and then I used three instruments. The psychological capital questionnaire had 12 questions. The organizational citizenship behavior five dimension scale had 20, and then the technical and social performance scale had seven. Um, I tried to minimize the number of questions that were going to be required to hopefully help people want to actually complete the survey. Um, out of I've sent out hundreds of emails um, for participants, and I believe I had 89 total or 88, which we'll go through in a few minutes. So now for my very exciting findings, um, we found that I had 81% leader participation and 19% were followers out of a total sample of 89. Um, the level of education was actually pretty high um, within the groups that participated. And so there was representation from all levels from associate through terminal degree. The ethnicity was um, the majority white or Caucasian. And then there was almost an even split amongst others um, that participated. And for gender identity, um, we had 64% identify as female and 36% identify as male. 
I asked a question, even though I know I had 17 actual leaders who were going to participate with their teams, I also wanted to know who within those groups supervised others. And so I found that 53% of total participants also supervised others and 47% did not when they were um, solo contributors. Each of the scales that I used had previously been um, scored as reliable, and so you'll see for both all three psychological capital, OCB, and the seven item technical and social performance scale were considered reliable and valid instruments. For um, my descriptive statistics, one of the interesting things that happened with psychological capital is everyone scored very high or scored themselves very high, which was a surprise because the survey came out just when um, COVID-19 hit and when people were being asked to work from home. And so I was under the assumption that, you know, people would have pretty low PSYCAP um, just kind of like a bummer where you're not in the office, you're working from home and everything that's going on within the world today. But surprisingly, we saw that everyone had very high PSYCAP levels. And in order to determine the high versus low in the group level, we had to do a bimodal median split. And that was conducted to divide the leaders into two groups. Because unfortunately, you know, everyone, according to how it would normally be rated, um, scored on the high end, but we needed to determine a low end. And from that split, um, the median was 4.33, which left nine leaders above 4.33 and eight leaders below 4.33. And this method was important because it helped to turn a continuous variable into a categorical one. Um, essentially, the idea is to find the median of the continuous variable and any value, like I said, below that was put in the low category and above that was labeled in the high category. The statistical test that were conducted was a linear regression, which is a basic regression model, and then also the multi-level regression. When you're dealing with regression, there are five assumptions that need to be proven. And so um, after conducting all of the tests, we did find that we were good with all of the five assumptions. So I'll just take you through visually scatter plots were used to help determine um, the five assumptions to make sure that we were clear to move forward with the regression analysis. So in my first hypothesis, a leader psychological, I'm sorry, a leader's level of psychological capital has a positive relationship with team levels of psychological capital. This is where we did the linear regression and the results indicated that the model explained 2.8% of the variance. Um, and so the model, contrary to a lot of the research that we've seen, did not support that the leader's level of psychological capital has a positive relationship with the team level. There's a few reasons for this, um, but we do believe that this hypothesis was not supported because there was not enough data. Um, additionally, the same thing for our um, hypothesis number two, where we were looking to see if there was a negative relationship between a leader with low psychological capital and team desirable organizational citizenship behaviors. Here, um, the results were done in a multi-level regression analysis. And um, really with multi-level, even though I fell within the guidelines from previous research in terms of how many groups that you wanna have and how many participants, I still believe that um, there was just not enough data to support this hypothesis either. And then the same with uh, hypothesis number three, where a leader will with high psychological capital will have a positive relationship with team job performance. The data from the multi-level analysis did not show or support um, this hypothesis either. However, um, even though the um, hypothesis weren't supported. I was so bummed in the beginning because I just knew I was right <laughs> and my data told me something differently. Uh, but there were some really great things that came out of the findings. And so we'll just walk through 
um, some interpretations of the findings. As I said, contrary to the hypothesis, the current study did not find that leader psychological capital was associated with follower PSYCAP, OCB, or job performance, but there are several reasons that we found when looking back at the results in comparison to previous data. Um, one of the things we found is um, there is a difference in the population. So if you look at the Chin report, which was the only other, um, one of the two other multi-level regression analysis, as I mentioned, um, Chin did his study in one company in Taiwan. And so we all know that there are many cultural differences between the US and um, Taiwan employees. And so what I found is I went back and looked at a study and I found a report that analyzed the differences between Taiwanese employees and United States employees by looking at um, Hofstede's cultural dimensions. And what it found is that you will see differences between the two countries depending on culture and environment and experience. And so some of the results that I see that are a little bit different than Chen's could actually be one, we used different methodology. Chin had more participants, and so he was able to do a little bit more robust statistical analysis than I was. And then two, we have those um, cultural differences. My study was done across multiple organizations from tech, professional services, nonprofit, higher education, um, so different industries. And um, his was done just within that one industry in that one company. So for hypothesis number two, um, my current study did not find that it was significantly associated, which is contrary to the literature um, that we've examined about psychological capital and organizational citizenship behaviors. But what we also um, found when looking at this is there could be a lack of association of psychological capital um, when you look directly at the leader's actual skills and behaviors. So what that means is a leader can have high psychological capital, but if they're in a toxic organization or an um, sorry, an oppressive organization, they may not have those same positive leadership skills and traits when they're actually in the job. So then it's not transferring. Um, over as they go about their daily activities with their teams. Um, hypothesis three, uh, which is contrary to previous literature again, that an individual's psychological capital was significantly associated with job performance, and here we just didn't see it. One of the other components of this is when you're looking at the aggregate, somehow um, it could have just gotten, like the influence, minimizes when you aggregate the team numbers together versus when you're looking at the individuals one-on-one. -on -one. And then some other differences that we could have come up against were um, the current study was a self-report measure for job performance, which means each individual person rated their own performance. However, in the Chin study, the manager rated the employee's performance, and they did it at two different time periods that were like 12 to 15 weeks apart. I only did my study in one moment in time, so that could have affected the results and caused some of the differences that we see today. Additionally, um, in previous studies, psychological capital and employee job performance were mediated through two other variables. And so I was trying to make a direct connection or relationship between leader PSYCAP and team job performance. Um, and I didn't make that connection. So it begs the question of whether or not PSYCAP needs to be mediated by other variables to show an impact. So some implications that we can look at is focusing on increasing individual psychological capital. There is absolutely enough research out there that shows that um, individuals with higher levels of psychological capital do perform better and demonstrate better behaviors. Leader psychological capital does not influence follower psychological capital or behaviors as psychological capital may not directly translate to positive leadership skills. So again, you can have very high PSYCAP, 
but you may not demonstrate those positive leadership skills that are needed to help with that transfer. But I do believe that businesses should still continue to incorporate positive PSYCAP into their organizational culture and leadership techniques. Some limitations of my study, um, it is possible that there was some bias despite my efforts to recruit participants using neutral language and assurances that their information would be um, unidentifiable. Um, we had a lot of participants who had, I believe our average was 18 years of work experience. So it kind of begs the question, which would be additional research at another point, does age actually affect or years of experience affect the individual's level of PSYCAP? My sample size, while in line with other um, recommendations, it was still pretty small for a multi-level methodology. My pool of leaders may not have been large enough, so I may have needed more leaders. And then additional statistical tests could have been performed to help analyze or further analyze the power of the relationships like a MANOVA, which is something that I will probably be working on next week. Uh, so some future research recommendations. I definitely think that other researchers should do multi-level analysis. It is complicated, it is hard, made me wanna cry quite a few times, um, but I think there's a lot of value in understanding the dynamic of the relationship once you're at a team level. Um, we should consider the use of methods other than self-report measures. And so specifically, can we include instruments or even observational methods that allow us to get um, a better idea of actual performance and behaviors? Um, to further understand the association between these three constructs at a multi um, level, uh, sorry, a multi-level may also be considered and using multiple measures. And so since there are tons of measures that we can use for um, job performance, then maybe we should not just use the technical and social, but look at other job performance measures as well. And then examine the association between psychological capital, OCB, and job performance over time. And Chen saw results after looking at two points in time. Um, my results varied looking at one point in time. So maybe these studies should be redone looking at two, three, or four different periods in time so that you can actually get a better understanding of how a person rates. So again, further analysis for the study of psychological capital and other complex constructs should be done. Um, it is possible that consistent with Chen's findings, the association between leader PSYCAP and job performance is not a direct association. And I feel like more should be done um, to study that. And then it might be that a leader psychological capital doesn't influence follower PSYCAP or behaviors as psychological capital may not directly translate to positive leadership skills. So it's a quick view of some of the references used um, for this study. And then I also wanted to just share, I'm gonna flip through a few pages here. This is all of the notes that my committee shared throughout this process regarding my dissertation and kind of like the action items and what I did to correct them. But um, throughout all of this, again, like I said, without this type of feedback, it wouldn't have been possible to complete the study. So I thank them again for that. And then I will open it to any questions. Melanie, well, can, uh, you know, great presentation. And I know thank the complexity you. of, uh, giving this presentation and the study that you conducted. And so really, congratulations on a good presentation. And so now I want to open it up to the committee to ask questions about the study and, a, and, and impressions. <laughs> I have a, a question, and it is based on something you said early on about how you were t told not to smile so much as a HR manager, and yes. um, it kind of relates to your finding that someone, a leader who has high psych cap, uh, that may not directly translate to, say, organizational citizenship be behaviors because of a toxic culture. Yes. So given that, and putting your consulting hat on and leadership hat on, 
what is the bottom line then? If you were sharing this information for, you know, with, a, uh, with individuals or with teams, mm -hmm. would you suggest that leaders push the culture, um, that they can't have any impact until the culture is addressed? I mean, what, do, what does this tell you? Yeah, you know, so I actually experienced a very toxic culture in my last job, and I noticed, like, the energy drain that it took for me to walk around being grumpy Melanie was way more than it typically takes for me to just be happy and engaging, and so I... Um, would say that there have to be fundamental cultural changes within an organization for leaders to actually show their true selves. And I think um, it took me a very, very long time to get confident enough to just say, this is me, take it or leave it, or this organization is not for me, which is why I'm not at the position that I previously was, because I just kind of accepted that I don't want to be that person. Um, I actually do score very high on the PSYCAP scale, which probably isn't a surprise to people who know me. Um, and so I think for organizations, like this just doesn't work for every company, right? So the company that I was at, where I was trying to do all of these things and I was talking about this and having discussions with the executive team on mental models and systems and all of this kind of stuff um, and how to motivate people and they just didn't want to hear it. And so I found that that wasn't an organization for me. So for companies who really want to see the positive changes, they have to pretty much shake up every part of the organization and then shake out the people who don't fit the new model. Okay, and I'll probe just a little bit more on that. And so given leaders have an opportunity to shape the culture, so someone with high PSYCAP, someone who is uh, more positive, would I guess be pushing status quo to try to, to, to make that a part of the culture, but how else can you have culture change unless you have leaders sort of driving it? Yeah, so I mean, it's really hard to do that. Once I think, or for first, I think you have to have, um, I don't even know how to describe it. Like it takes a lot of gumption to fight against <laughs> those types of environments. And I think for leaders who maybe can't leave a job, like it can start with your team. So one of the things I did in my last job is I did everything I could to protect my team from the crazy. And so I made sure everyone knew you come to me first, you don't go directly to my team. And it wasn't because I didn't think they had the ability to do their job. It was because I was creating a model of what our team culture was going to be since I couldn't affect the organizational culture. And I didn't want anything impeding on that. So it meant that I dealt with a lot of BS and a lot of headaches, but then I was able to craft the message that I delivered to my team um, to make it less hard harsh than what it was delivered to me as and there was a lot um, and I've done that at several jobs it's like as the leader if you are in an organization where you don't have the ability to be positive on a broader scale you can be when it comes to managing your team okay and so you kind of have answered my second question in terms of uh, your takeaway from this study, even though some of the hypotheses weren't supported, you talked about implications, what you could do differently. Again, I'm picturing you in a room, say at a conference, sharing some of your insights from here. What would be the bottom line takeaway you'd want your audience to, to have? So I think the bottom line takeaway is that leaders can have an impact on their team, right? And that's very important, even though, um, like I feel like if I had a larger sample, some of the hypotheses that I was looking at would have had a different result. And so it's very important to understand um, the impact that you have on your team, how that affects them, how it affects their development, um, and how it motivates them not only to be within like the company confines, but how it motivates them outside of that. Um, I actually, so I posted about graduating and one of my interns when I owned a company had a horrible name, Complete Concepts Consulting, back in 2010, thanked me and she sent me a private message that said that I still to this day, she's like, I can't remember what we did when we worked together, but I can still remember how you motivated me and you continue to motivate me to accomplish my goals. So that was a situation where I was a startup, had no money, had just been laid off. 
life was miserable, trying to figure out how to get growth free, but none of that was my team's problem. And so every time we met and we worked together, I gave them 100% of me. And then I went home and cried about everything else that was going on and got back up and did it again the next day. Um, and so I think that's kind of like the biggest takeaway is you can absolutely make an impact, but it depends on how you want to get up every day and go to work and engage with your team. Okay. All right. Thank you. Let me uh, let Dr. Thompson step in. I might have one more question, but. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So Melanie, great job on a really difficult analysis. And as I mentioned in the feedback, I think we want to be really careful that it's not that your hypotheses aren't supported because we don't have enough information to say they're not supported yet, you know? So, right. um, and I noticed they're in the right direction. So I agree with you. I think if you had more cases, you would have seen what you were looking for. So, um, um, you know, I wouldn't rule that out yet. Um, my, I, my two questions are really around um, the basic correlations, and I'm interested um, what, how PSYCAP related to organizational behavior and performance, not at the group level, but just at the individual level. Yeah, so at the individual level, I actually didn't have time to focus on very much, <laughs> to be quite okay. honest. But some observations that I did make, um, organizational citizenship behavior in general scored very low across all participants, which made me think, even though I didn't write about the pandemic because I didn't have enough literature to really support any assumptions about how the pandemic affected the results, I do think if you look at organizational citizenship behaviors and how they measure like your interactions on a daily basis with people, I can see how it scored kind of low if you're working at home for the first time, you know, you're not engaging with your team, when the study, when participants were taking the questionnaire, like we all were just adapting to like what this world means for us. And I work from home every day. So for me, it was like no big deal. But for a lot of my colleagues across like um, the UK, Ireland, India, like they really struggled. And we had to have a couple of special meetings for those of us who work from home every day to encourage those who don't work from home every day and like share some tips and stuff like that. So that was one of the biggest things that stuck out to me is would OCB look a little bit different last year if I did this yeah. compared to what it looks like this year. And then I was also really surprised that PSYCAP was so high. You know, because that's just normal. Yeah, your just your your side cap is hitting right in the norm for all side cap. So I think you're you're just right there. I, I wouldn't characterize it as high, given it's on a six point scale. Yeah. So you're you know I, I think what's important is that the side cap stayed the same through the pandemic. Yes. Right, but it makes sense that organization organizational citizenship behaviors are a little bit less because um, you're not really at the organization. Yeah. Right, so you're, you're at home and you're probably doing more home stuff than organizational stuff, right? right. I can also see where people struggling to adapt to work from home would, um, you know, really be suffering. So I see that, yeah. But I think your PSYCAP is, um, I think it's good that it wasn't too much higher, too much lower. So that's showing us it's stable throughout, um, the downturn, so yeah, to speak. yeah. So that that's all the questions I've had. I'm, I'm just I'm, I'm and I'm continuing to be curious about the um, the the relationship the, the correlation between those. Yeah, and I would love to run this study again, like in two years, to really compare and see. I know I wouldn't get the same body of people, <laughs> but it would just be interesting to see. Um, what the impact might be or the differences might be 12 or 24 months from now compared to the data that I have today. Very good, thank you. Uh, Melanie, I know I gave, I already gave you some feedback, but I just wanna dig a little deeper on the topic of the relationship between PSYCAP and positive leadership skills. Mm -hmm. So could you expand a little bit more about what that means for you know, if you're going out as a consultant and developing leaders, what does that mean? Yeah. So to me, it really means that we have to look at, I mean, culture is a big thing. For a while, it was a buzzword. Right now, it's like really serious. Um, 
even when you look at like employee engagement and things like that, um, I think we have to start looking at our leaders able to be their authentic selves. And I think for the most part, they aren't. I believe that that's changing. I think millennials and Generation Z are demanding a little bit more of that, here I am, I'm me, just accept it. But if you look at even my career, generation, I don't know what I am, Generation X, um, like you just, when, in, when I started, you couldn't be you. Like I can't say that I truly became Melanie at work until I started my own business in 2010 and realized, like, what the heck have I been doing? But you try to be what the company wants you to be or what your boss dictates for you to be. And I think that we need to break that down and really allow and accept people to be who they are um, and to accept it and then value the diversity of that as well. Um, there's a lot of talk about diversity and inclusion right now, but to me, diversity is more than putting like people with brown skin or women in a role. It's about diversity of thoughts and ideas and bringing that all together to make better businesses. Mm -hmm. And so even with the teams I manage, like I don't care if you're first year or if you got 20 years of experience, everybody gets a voice because then that makes our product even better in the end. Thank you, yeah. No, I agree with you. I think that's an interesting kind of slant to take a look. And I actually did write down about the authenticity and leader behavior. Because I yeah. think even though if you do come in with high side cap and that you present yourself a certain way, but if you don't have the relational skills, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. And my current job is the first place that I ever put that to the test. And so I was very upfront in the interview. Like, I don't deal with drama. I don't deal with BS. I do my job. I'm very good at doing my job and take me how I am. And so now when situations pop up, my manager will say, I'll deal with that for you. Like, I know you don't wanna deal with the drama, so let me just take care of it and I'll come back to you, which speaks to how like I should have been doing that from the beginning and just setting those boundaries. Um, mm -hmm. I never thought about it. But then what's really interesting is they always put me on calls with clients who are angry because they know that since I don't feed into the emotion and the drama, I'm the best person to be on that call because I'm just gonna stick to the facts. Mm -hmm. I, you know, believe in very high levels of customer service. I get the problem solved and then I move on to the next one. So there's definitely some benefits to actually speaking out and saying like, I will give you my all, but I will not give you my all. <laughs> so. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. So then, and I know you addressed this a little bit. You were talking about the, how you think the uh, assessment, the OCB assessment would be getting different results because we're mostly working remotely mm -hmm. uh, because of the impact of the pandemic. But I wondered, do you think if you look at that instrument, do you think there's maybe a call to alter that instrument a little bit or update it? Because if we are, if companies decide to stay with remote working, wouldn't OCB look a little different in a remote environment or? Yeah, I think so. Cause there are some questions like I give up my lunch or go get lunch for somebody, or I don't remember like the specifics, but there are some questions that you specifically have to be working down the hall from someone to be able to exhibit that. And so now with the majority of people working from home and we're all like zoomed to death, <laughs> you, know, you have three or four zoom meetings a day. I definitely think that it's something that um, you just have to rethink it. Um, I also think like most companies didn't think that work from home would work in a lot of respects, mm -hmm. that people wouldn't be productive and things like that. But you're now looking at like my company is 4,500 employees in 50 different countries and we're getting emails from the CEO saying that we have been more productive than we have been. Clients are more happy than they have been in a very long time. Um, they're looking at decreasing their real estate footprint across the globe and moving to more of like a Regis or co-working, like hoteling type of space mm -hmm. if you feel like you need to be in an office. So this shift to me is a permanent one and I don't think we'll ever really go back to for the most part that in the office nine to five 
Um, so you definitely have to rethink things like OCB. I was also thinking with the performance, like self rater performance may not be the best option, especially for those people with like the halo effect and I'm great. I do everything great. <laughs> you know, I'm a five across the whole line. And so if I had to do this again and have more time, I would probably do the manager rating performance and self rater just to try to do a comparison and see what that looks like. Okay. Yeah, great. Yeah, that that's a good perspective of what would be a next study. Yeah. So then, and then, uh, I, I, you know, as I'm listening, of course, I'll have always more questions. Do you think there is, I mean, I know um, Dr. Thompson said we're in a good range for levels of the norm for PSYCAP. Do you think there was any possible influence of the industries of where you gathered the people from at all or? You know, I don't know. It could have been. Another thing, too, if you look at the industries that I used, um, they weren't affected by, like, layoffs and the things that we saw in retail. Okay. Um, you know, one of my company, participating companies dropped out because they basically had to let go of 90% of their staff um, mm -hmm. and things like that. So we didn't have people that were as negatively impacted as others. So if I did a restaurant group, even at the like leadership level or the administrative level, we might have seen scores a little bit different because they were in the midst of having conversations about layoffs and things like that. Um, one of the biggest per, uh, participants was my own company that I work for, and we were at a point where you know our we had just had a meeting. Our company is very cash heavy. You know the CEO is outlining all the things they'll do before they reduce staff. So another thing I mentioned in the dissertation is that like the mood, your mood. Um, could absolutely affect like that point in time, depending on how you feel. If you mm -hmm. want a million dollars in the lottery, you're going to ask a lot differently <laughs> or answer a lot yeah. differently yeah. than if you just found out that you were getting a 30% reduction in pay. So all of those variables, I think, affected the way people responded. Okay, thank you. So then um, did that spark any other additional questions from the committee? I know Dr. Williams has said you might have another follow-up or question or? You actually uh, addressed the one on industry, so I'm good. I'm good. Okay, good. Dr. Thompson? I'm good too. Sorry, there's a lot of yard work in the background, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, perfect. Well then, um, I thank you so much, Melanie, for your presentation. And so a little out of the norm, I know that a lot of people uh, invite or joined in along the way. So if you'd like to unmute and say something to Melanie at this point um, or put stuff in chat, that's great. Congratulations, Melanie. Thank you, PJ. Awesome job. Congratulations. Congratulations, Thank Melanie. It's Heather. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Congratulations, you. Mel. I love you. I'm so proud of you. This is just ah. absolutely amazing. You should be so proud of yourself. This is brilliant. Thank, Thank you. you. That's my middle sister, everybody. <laughs> so amazing. Congrats, Melanie. Thank you, Alinda. Congrats, Dr. Boone. Congrats, Melanie. Yeah, Thank, Dr. You. Boone. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah, let me Boone check myself. Dr. Boone. Oh, you all. Thank you. <laughs> And thank all of you all for coming. Like, I was all nervous, but I was like, oh, I see people are here. I would be all right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know I wanted to honor your request of not sending out an announcement, but then I see the chain reaction of your cohort, and I just couldn't. I well, couldn't you know, hold back. So I wanted to invite uh, – I didn't want to send the big thing because I wanted, like, the people who have been in it from the beginning to be the ones to see – the the ending of it and I've gotten so much support from my family I think my other sister Cynthia was floating around somewhere on here and yeah. my mom and uh, my cohort and my new lifelong 